the start of every new quarter, I like to look back on where we're coming from because it can tell you a lot about the state of the market going forward. And if you go back over the past three months, I can't believe which stock led the Dow Jones Industrial Average last quarter. Amgen, the perennially underwhelming pharmaceutical company that's seen its price to earnings multiple shrink bit by bit for years, as even its biggest discoveries get overshadowed by its competitors. But this quarter, it all came together for the former growth company and late entry to the Dow Jones average, just got out three years ago. Amgen made some real inroads to cancer treatments in some of the largest markets. And they also put up some studies that show that Repatha, their anti-cholesterol drug, maybe should be taken by far more people than currently use it. If you believe that all cholesterol is bad for you, as I do, then arguably everyone in America should be on this thing. But the biggest thing that happened to Amgen, though, had less to do with the company itself and more to do with the public defrocking of Lena Khan. Yeah, the dogmatic head of the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, who tried and failed to block Amgen's acquisition of Horizon Pharma, an orphan drug company with great pipeline and excellent prospects and no overlap. See, this case was a total travesty. Khan came up with some novel argument about how Amgen would be able to browbeat the pharmacy benefit managers into taking the full suite of products at inflated prices if the deal went through. Never mind that it's the PBMs who do most of the browbeating. Never mind that nobody's ever accused Amgen of these practices. Never mind that management was willing to stipulate they'd never do it. All that meant nothing to Khan, who just kept pursuing the case anyway, because she seems to believe that uh, every merger is anti-competitive. Every one. But after making little headway in court back in September, the FTC made a deal where Amgen basically agreed to what it had already stipulated to agree to in the form of a consent order. And then the merger was allowed to close. Oh, it was a gigantic win for Amgen, a gigantic win for business, allowed its stock to roar, and a gigantic loss for Lena Khan's FTC. Between Amgen and her inability to block the Microsoft Activision deal, another move that made zero sense in the the antitrust laws we actually have on the books, I think we're seeing the high water mark of what I would call anti-business insanity. I just hope she drops her vendetta against Amazon before it becomes one more black mark against what I always thought was a very good agency from the day it was formed. She's treating American business like it's some sort of socialist law school summer project. What a travesty. Second best performer in the Dow last quarter is Caterpillar. Now, something amazing happened to Cat this quarter. Going into this period, the company was widely viewed as a China play, a proxy that needed great economic growth in the PRC to make its numbers. Given the collapse of China and the dreaded inverted yield curve, here in the U.S., conventional wisdom said the cat stock was a goner and short sellers piled into it. But then Jim Uppleby, the unsinkable cat CEO, came to New York and traced out a different scenario. He said the cat was more levered to data centers than to China, that mining, which is actually doing pretty well these days, and oil drilling are more important than China. And then he pointed out the cat's dealer network, which almost everyone in the analyst community thinks has too much inventory, actually won't have enough inventory once the federal government's infrastructure bonanza hits. Slowly but surely, the bears have been converted to bulls, yet the stock still sells for just 13 times next year's earnings, which is a big reason why we've been reluctant to lock in a nice gain on this one for the Chapel Trust. I believe Caterpillar can go to 30, 300. It go to 300, 30 points, 40 points. Easy. If you want more detail on, that, on the $300 price target that we're using, you can join the CNBC Investing Club. Third best performer, Chevron. We know oil's been ridiculously powerful this year until today, taking off from nothing simply because the Russians and the Saudis have cut back production in order to pop up the market. Meanwhile, our president, who dumped millions of barrels into the, uh, into the market from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve at high prices to help push oil lower, uh, said he was going to buy back the oil, and then he didn't. Woulda, shoulda, coulda, Mr. President. Now there's not enough left in the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for Biden to push down the price. The Saudis and the Russians seem determined not to let oil come down. Meanwhile, our own oil industry has only increased production by the low single digits because they don't want to knock prices down either. So the geopolitical chess match, not organic demand, has pulled oil higher. Perhaps that's why the oil stocks haven't been anywhere near as strong as crude itself. That's why Chevron was only the third best performer in the Dow for the third quarter. Judging purely by the price of oil, it should have been number one. It got killed today, by the way. I like the oils here, and I wish we owned Chevron for the Chapel Trust, but we prefer Pioneer Natural Resources for what I think would be a giant special dividend, and Kotara, which we've been buying here right now, for its exposure to natural gas, which could soar if we get a cold winter either here or in Europe, because it's now one price internationally. By the way, Chevron's 3.6% yield was the type of th uh, thing it used to attract people to the stock market before we went to this crazy bond market we got now. Fourth best performer, Intel of all things. Why did Intel run so much? I think it's because the company's simply not doing as badly as it used to be. Pretty low bar. But there are always people looking for the Intel of old. Whenever they get a whiff of it, they can't resist. I got news for these buyers. Intel may be better than it was, and I congratulate them for that. 
But this company certainly ain't what it used to be. Intel isn't first in any area of the tech food chain that truly matters. Their best hope is that we get a huge personal computer renaissance. I said that in honor of uh, my friend Will Frost from Britain. But if you think PCs are about to get a whole lot better, I'd much rather play that with AMD. While I'm glad that Intel's no longer spiraling out of control, I, I, that's not really a ringing endorsement. Even as Intel's adherents have never really thrown in the towel, they seem to believe it has some sort of vast skunk works project somewhere, maybe in the, I don't know, Barstow, uh, that will make it possible for Intel to take the AI mantle from NVIDIA. I think that's nuts. Intel's got, gotten into the habit of being real late to major trends, even though it says it's always number one. But that's OK. I don't mind braggadocio now and then. I don't see that changing anytime soon. Finishing up the top five is a company that dinged the whole group's invincibility over the year, United Health Group, UNH. This managed care company talked about an unexpected spike in operations post-COVID. Something that's bad news if you're in the health insurance business. It took the whole group down, but in a sign that those worries are now in the past, the stock has had a remarkable comeback. Personally, I'd rather own the much cheaper Humana, which we own for the trust and we've championed for ages. I expect Humana to see some meaningful outperformance from now to the end of the year. So here's the bottom line. When you look at the Dow's five top performers last quarter, most of them were, let's say, unexpected, at least by Wall Street. And at least for the quarter, the ugliness in the bond market didn't create the kind of havoc that some of us would have expected. While the companies knew they were getting better, the market misjudged them. I wouldn't be surprised if they give us more strength now that we're in the fourth quarter, but only if we see an end of the 10-year tyranny, which is after, after this historic rise, is always a possibility. Bad money, we back after the break. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.